During World War I, the term shell shock emerged to describe a specific condition known as the thousand-yard stare. This vacant and unfocused gaze is commonly observed in individuals who have witnessed the horrors of war and combat zones. It is closely associated with the victims of shell shock, which is now referred to as post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. The advancements in technology and weaponry during World War I resulted in deadlier and more varied ways of attacking and killing the enemy. Consequently, this led to a significant increase in psychological trauma among soldiers, unlike anything seen before. In February 1915, Dr. and Captain Charles S. Myers first used the term shell shock in a report for The Lancet, where he examined the cases of three young men. From his observations, a list of common yet diverse symptoms of shell shock was established, including sleeplessness, anxiety, fear, hallucinations, memory loss, and severe psychosis. Physical symptoms such as headaches, nausea, and dizziness, collectively known as neurasthenia, were also recorded. Dr. William Aldrin Turner further expanded on Meyer's report, emphasizing the connection between physical and mental symptoms resulting from witnessing extreme war violence. He highlighted cases where mental shock led to physiological symptoms that persisted long after the initial trauma. By December 1914, it is estimated that 7 to 10 percent of all British officers and 3 to 4 percent of other ranks were suffering from shell shock. Turner recommended specific treatments for those with neurasthenia. Despite the varying degrees of severity in nervous shock and neurasthenia, rest and recovery at home influenced his recommendations. And see for yourself what I'm talking about. The observations made by Turner, who had the advantage of studying multiple participants over an extended period, allowed him to make further distinctions between different types of shell shock, which he referred to as nervous shock. Turner was possibly the first to realize that shell shock was not solely caused by acts of war, but also by general wear and tear over time. He noted that specific war conditions, such as intense fighting on the front lines, were more likely to result in shell shock. Turner observed that battles with heavy artillery fire, like those in Flanders and around Ypres, saw more cases of shell shock. Despite early optimism from Myers and Turner about recovery, by 1916 very few shell shock cases had returned to fighting. Return rates varied between different hospitals, with the UK experiencing lower rates compared to France. The understanding of shell shock seemed to regress as the number of cases increased, possibly due to the panic caused by the realization of the widespread impact on soldiers. Initially, Hypnotherapy was advocated by physicians like Myers and Turner. Over the course of the next few years, the effectiveness of psychotherapy in treating shell shock came under scrutiny. Lieutenant Colonel Gordon Holmes took over from Myers, aligning his methods more closely with the British Army's preferences. However, his approach unfortunately contradicted recent findings on the impact of shell shock on its victims. Holmes's reported relapse rates were significantly lower than reality failing to acknowledge the many men treated for shell shock who never returned to active duty. This led to a widespread belief in Britain that shell shock was a sign of mental and spiritual weakness. This mindset likely contributed to the prevalence of shell shock in the British military, as the public adhered to the ideals of the stiff upper lip and resilience. Unfortunately, the situation deteriorated further when Holmes closed Myers' treatment centers for shell shock redirecting resources to soldiers with more visible illnesses. This decision perpetuated the misconception that shell shock was a form of cowardice or mental frailty. Holmes's actions directly influenced the harsh treatment of shell shock patients, with the most severe cases being sent to asylums and hospitals, where treatment varied from humane to cruel. Dr. Lewis Yane's controversial use of electrotherapy in treating shell shock patients is a notable example of the extreme measures taken during this time. In his 1918 work on the historical disorders of warfare, the author documented various treatment methods he used on shell shock sufferers, likening them to the electroshock therapy commonly employed until the 1980s. Despite their barbarism, he described these treatments as successful. 
One of the main techniques he favored involved administering electric shocks to the throat, neck, and limbs for prolonged and horrifying periods. In some cases, he even resorted to using hot plates on the skin and extinguishing lit cigarettes on the patient's tongue. The effectiveness of these methods in curing shell shock remains uncertain, but the author firmly believed in their efficacy. The understanding and treatment of shell shock varied significantly throughout World War I, and by the war's end, there was still no consensus among medical professionals. Consequently, soldiers suffering from shell shock silently endured their affliction, unable or unwilling to discuss it. This, coupled with the prevailing belief that it indicated cowardice, hindered progress in comprehending the condition and its consequences in the decade following the war. The most notable investigation into shell shock was the South Borough Report in 1922. However, even this report failed to reach a consensus on the causes of shell shock, as the experts consulted held divergent opinions. Instead of addressing this challenge in defining the primary causes of shell shock, the report primarily focused on recommendations for future affairs and largely attributed the illness to factors such as inadequate training of troops in specific battles. Despite justifications and investigations, the fact remains that, at least in the eyes of the British military, shell shock sufferers during World War I were largely viewed as cowards. In many instances, they were even sent to the front lines as a form of punishment. This perspective disregards the reality that many individuals would naturally hesitate in the face of war and certain death. These individuals were not cowards, but rather victims of an illness that was triggered by the horrifying reality they had to confront on a daily basis. They deserve acknowledgement and an apology for the tarnished reputation they acquired as a result. However, astonishingly, it wasn't until 2006 that an official pardon was finally issued to those who were executed under the pretext of cowardice during World War I. It took decades for society to start taking individuals with mental illnesses seriously. It is important to remember the significance of this. I'm eager to hear about your own learning journey and the knowledge you acquire. Leave a comment below and share what you have learned about the thousand yard stare and shell shock. If you enjoyed the video and want to see behind the scenes and get access to special perks, like seeing videos before they are posted to the channel, as well as a members only discord, the option to join the round table is here. The round table is my channel's membership group. I think it is fitting with the history content and it is only 99 cents per month.